Okay, so we just saw that it's quite easy for a field theory to not be renormalizable. Uh, I want to now, um, and I may have given you the impression that a non-renormalizable theory is, is terrible, is horrible in some sense, and uh, this isn't actually true. So uh, I want to now talk about what it really means for a theory to be non-renormalizable, and um, uh, to that extent, let's first understand what does the dimension of the coupling mean physically, okay? So what does the dimension of the coupling have to do with physics? So um, let's imagine that um, we add a non-renormalizable term to our lambda phi to the fourth theory. So let's imagine add, adding a term uh, like phi to the sixth to our 4D lambda phi to the fourth theory, our usual workhorse. Um, so in 4D, the dimension of phi is one, And so I can write the interaction Lagrangian involving this new lambda phi to the sixth term like this. It's the integral d4x c over m squared phi to the sixth, where here um, m uh, has dimensions of mass, as you might expect from its name, and c is dimensionless. Okay, So c here is a dimensionless uh, small coupling and perturbation theory. Now, the claim is that if we add this term to our theory, then now the theory is non-renormalizable, and we no longer have predictive power if we take the cutoff in our theory to infinity. Let's try to understand why that is. Um, why did that happen? So let's imagine, um, uh, uh, let's, let's imagine uh, asking the following question. Let's calculate some kind of an observable, okay? So let's ask, for example, how a scattering amplitude depends on the energy. So I'm talking about the scattering amplitude that involves this, this coupling in some way, this, this uh, phi to the six coupling, and I'm gonna ask how it depends on the energy uh, incoming. Okay, so there's some sort of center of mass energy E associated with this process. I want to ask how the amplitude depends on E. Now, um, uh, I also want to ask that only to first order in C. Now, um, you see a scattering amplitude at the end of the day is some kind of a probability, and probabilities are dimensionless. And so we can see immediately that the contribution to this sort of scattering amplitude from this term, this phi to the sixth term, just from dimensional analysis must take the form C over M squared and this is happening because we're only doing it to first order in C, but because the scattering amplitude is dimensionless, there must be an E squared up top, okay? And so you see from dimensional analysis alone, we can calculate how this thing depends on this, the, the energy E, okay, the incoming energy E. And again, in full honesty, this is pretty much how you should first do a quantum field theory calculation. You should just first do a sort of rough thing like this and look at how the thing should depend on, on the energy. Then you do a careful calculation to see what actually happens, okay? So we can see that there's an energy up top uh, and this mass scale which defines the coupling is in the bottom, okay? Now note what this means. What this means is no matter what, this interaction um, is unimportant at low energies. This contribution goes to zero as E goes to zero and so this is not important at low energy, okay? There's an E in the numerator. However, at the same time, notice that if we take E big, in other words, if we take E to be the order of the mass scale M, then this term is no longer small anymore. Oops. Uh, this term is no longer small anymore, okay? In fact, if you take E to be order M, this term is going to be of order one, all right? So in other words, when E is of order M, then perturbation theory has broken down. Okay. And what is happening then is that this theory is fine at low energies, 
But at high energies in the UV, this theory is becoming strongly coupled. Okay. And um, you see, this is what perturbation theory, this is what non renormalizability means in perturbation theory. non renormalizability tells us that we don't know something that is happening in the UV. Okay. That's what non renormalizable means. And that is why we can't take the cutoff to infinity and retain predictive power. Okay. So we don't know. What is happening in the UV? Okay, so now you should ask, you know, that, that's fine, but suppose someone gives you a non renormalizable theory, uh, what should you do with it? Now you see, you, you can't really take the cutoff to infinity, so what you should do is take the cutoff seriously, you know, have the cutoff hanging around in your calculation, and then just try to ask questions at energies much smaller than the cutoff. Okay. And then you can hope that this cutoff won't affect your life too much and, and things will be okay. And the idea behind this philosophy is basically the idea behind effective field theory, which basically makes precise this idea that you can have a field theory with a, with a cutoff and still work with it at energies much smaller than the cutoff. Okay. And in fact, this idea that you, you use a non renormalizable field theory even at low energies or at low energies where it's predictive is really, really important and is one of the most important ideas in quantum field theory. Okay. So um, this idea will be much more carefully developed in the class on renormalization, uh, the renormalization group rather, um, next term, uh, which I encourage everyone to take, okay. the RG class, that will develop this thing properly. Okay. Use an idea called the renormal renormalization group to really make this very precise. So um, in the meantime, though, I want to introduce to you um, some ideas for a few of my favorite non renormalizable the field theories to make you feel a bit more comfortable with the idea that field theories can be non renormalizable. Okay. So here are two of my favorite non renormalizable field theories. Okay, number one, uh, pions. Okay, so uh, what are pions? Uh, pions are particles that exist in real life. Uh, you've probably heard of them. Uh, they're so-called mesons, and they have a mass of about um, 135 MeV. Okay, and um, there are three kinds of them we can model their behavior at low energies uh, with a triplet of real scalar fields. So I can write the pion fields as a triplet of, of real scalar fields. This, this vector symbol runs from one, two, three. And um, in a particular limit, uh, where that limit is uh, massless quarks, let me not get into that. You'll learn more about this in your QCD class, but there's a limit, a physically reasonable limit, where you can uh, ignore the pion mass and you can write their action like this. It's a kinetic term, oops, for the pions. And then there's a bunch of interaction terms. Uh, the leading interaction term takes the following form. It's one over two, pi squared, u pi dot into pi, uh, multiplying the same thing again. Okay. And then there's many, many more interactions. This goes on. All right. So um, this is an example of a, of a non-renormalizable non field theory. We see that explicitly, uh, we can see from here that f pi has dimensions of mass, okay? It's called the pion decay constant. All right, and it's um, uh, yeah, and it controls the um, and it controls the uh, the interactions, 
And we can see from here that because f pi has dimensions of mass, this coupling constant right here has negative mass dimension because f pi is in the denominator. And uh, therefore, this is a non renormalizable field theory. Okay, this one right here. And uh, I should just tell you that in real life, the value of f pi is, uh, is 93 MeV. Okay. Now, um, now, that's true, but nevertheless, this theory of pions that I've written down is still perfectly fine at low energies. For example, you might ask the question, what happens if I scatter together two pions with energy E? And again, let's try to calculate the amplitude. Well, we can do this from dimensional analysis. The leading interaction is here. And we can see that there's a 1 over f pi squared in the uh, denominator. And therefore, there must be an E squared in the numerator. Okay, so this is perfectly fine. If you scatter together pions, this is actually how the scattering amplitude looks. Um, but you can see that it breaks down at energies E of the order of f pi. In other words, at energies E, which are close to 93 MeV. Okay, so what's actually happening? You see, the pion theory breaks down, the pion perturbation theory breaks down, but, and from this pi on Lagrangian alone, we don't know what to do. But in real life, we do know what to do. In real life, we know that the real theory of the strong interactions is not the pi on theory, but QCD. And in fact, each pi on is made up of quarks that are held together by a strong interaction, by QCD. What is happening at these energies, E of order F pi, is that this pi on, which is made up of quarks, is starting to break loose, is starting to break apart, and the quarks that make it up are starting to make their presence known. And you can no longer describe it using the pion theory alone. You have to use QCD to describe the full theory. Okay. Now, QCD is a great theory. It really does describe this. And in fact, QCD is renormalizable. Okay. So you can use QCD to describe the scattering at, at higher amplitudes. Okay. Higher energies, sorry. Okay. So the main point that I'm trying to make here is that there's really some physical content to the fact that the theory breaks down. You need to use a more complete theory to tell you what's happening in the ultraviolet of a non renormalizable theory. And for the case of the pion theory, the more complete theory is QCD. Okay. Now let's move on. I'm going to discuss another non renormalizable theory. This is my second example. And this theory is gravity. Okay. Unlike the pion theory, gravity requires no introduction. Everyone knows about gravity. And in fact, because you're all very sophisticated students by now, you all know the Lagrangian for gravity. It's the Einstein-Hilbert action, which Aristos has told you about. And the Einstein-Hilbert action is the action for gravity. It looks like this. Now let's do something bold, which people have probably told you that you can't do. Uh, let's treat gravity as a quantum field theory. Okay, so we're going to do this by expanding our quantum field theory around flat space. So in other words, take the metric G and write it as the flat metric plus a small perturbation H. Okay, so H is some very small perturbation. It's the so-called graviton. Okay. And now uh, let's treat H as a quantum field. Just to be clear, H is a tensor field, just like G mu nu and eta mu nu. Okay, so what we do now is we take this ansatz and we plug this ansatz into this into this action, and uh, we get something that looks kind of like this, very very schematically because this is actually a disaster, as you can imagine. Trying to expand things out, the indices really just go completely crazy, but it looks something like this, okay? Because the Ricci scalar R it goes at lowest order like dh squared. And so we get something like uh, r is dh squared, and then there's this square root of the determinant of g, and you actually get infinite powers of, uh, of h. Okay, So you get a series of terms that looks like this, and so on and so forth. Okay, Infinite series of powers of h going on forever, coming back both from the square root and from the fact that you have to take the inverse metric, and so on. Okay. So this is the action for this field h. And we're now going to treat this using our normal rules of quantum field theory. Okay. 
So let's first do our dimension counting. We can see uh, right here that uh, H is dimensionless. And what that means is Gn, the Newton's constant, must have a dimension of minus 2. And the resulting dimensionful scale coming from that is called the Planck scale. All right. So in other words, I'm going to write 1 over 16 pi Gm as m Planck squared, where m Planck is a scale that determines the quantum strengths of gravity and is about um, 10 to the 19 GeV in real life. Okay. Now, to make this look like a normal quantum field theory, what we want to do is have the term in dh squared not have this weird coupling in front of it. I want to make it have a normal normalization. And so what I'm going to do is rescale my field h. I'm going to write a new field h hat, which is m Planck times h. And if we now write our action in terms of m hat, what we see is that I have picked this to make the g Newton go away from here. But of course, now it's going to reappear in all the rest. So there's a term like h hat squared over m Planck squared plus h hat to the fourth over m Planck to the fourth, and so on and so forth. OK. So now let's look at this for a second. If we didn't have this series of terms here, then this would just be a normal quantum field theory, okay, with a normal kinetic term. However, we do have all of these guys, and this is therefore a theory with a coupling constant with negative mass dimension. And what this means is that quantum gravity is non-renormalizable. Okay. In other words, gravity viewed as a quantum field theory is non-renormalizable. So you've probably heard that there's some difficulty in, in building quantum gravity, the theory of quantum gravity. This is what people mean, okay? This thing right here that is a coupling constant with negative mass dimension. Now, having said that, you see, this doesn't mean that all is lost. Everything is fine with quantum gravity at low energies, okay? So quantum gravity is totally OK at low energies. It's only at high energies, when you're trying to scatter together gravitons at the Planck scale, at energies close to m Planck, that things break down, just like the pi on Lagrangian I just told you earlier. Things are bad. In particular, this quantum gravity, this, this effective Lagrangian, uh, becomes very strongly coupled. So um, now there's a difference between the pion theory in, and this one. In the pion theory, we knew what to do. We knew that we had to use QCD at high energies. And really the reason why we knew that is because we have experiments from particle accelerators that tell us that QCD is the right theory and everything works out great. It, quantum gravity is harder simply because we cannot build an accelerator to directly probe these energy scales. But having said that, um, string theory is a, is a good candidate to, to play the role uh, so string theory is to quantum is to low energy quantum gravity pretty much as QCD is to the pi on Lagrangian. String theory is a candidate UV completion. Okay, things are harder because of a pesky lack of experiments. And um, finally, I just want to stress that you can use this Lagrangian fine at low energies. In particular, you can, for example, calculate the quantum one loop correction to the Newtonian potential and things like that. And I've given you a nice uh, review of that in the lecture notes if you're interested in seeing how that works. Okay, that's all.